Okay, you can get started. He's gonna put us on live any second. Okay, well, just give me the, uh, let me know when we're live. Oh, it says live on my- You are live. Okay, great. Uh, everybody, uh, welcome this morning to our virtual farm tour. Almost as good as the real thing. Um, I, you know, that's the, that's one of the many negative things about COVID nineteen. We're not actually able to get out and into the field and meet real people and see what they're doing in real time. But this is a, a great opportunity, and I want to uh, thank our friends in rural Maryland and especially Lindsay Thompson for having set this up. So, you know, I'm just going to stop right there, and why don't we just get right into it? Lindsay, are you in charge? Sure, I can be in charge. So okay. good morning, everyone. My name is Lindsay Thompson. I'm with the Maryland Grain Producers Association, and we're so happy to have you all here for our virtual farm tour. Sorry that we couldn't have you out in person, but hopefully next year we will be able to get back out on the farm and um, see all of these things in person again. So this morning we have put together a virtual farm tour. So Janelle Eck on my staff, thank you very much to our videographer and editor extraordinaire. And we are going to be featuring four farms this morning. And uh, the first of which is going to be John Bruning of Bruning Farms. Uh, down on the Lower Eastern Shore, right on the Chincoteague Bay. Jason Scott of Walnut Hill, who farms with his dad, um, Doug, and his mom, Patty. And then we're also going to see Mary Lou and Ashley Brown, poultry farmers in um, Dorchester County. And then we will end with Mason's Heritage and Mason Produce, so Bill Mason and his son-in-law, Stephen, and his daughter, Kate. So we are very excited to have you all see this. Um, I have the volume all the way up on my end, and so you can adjust the volume on your end. If you have any issues hearing, uh, just shoot me a message in the chat, and we will see what we can do. So here we go for our virtual farm tour. You try one more time. Hold on. <laughs> Just in case. My name is John Bruning of Bruning Farms here in Snow Hill, Maryland. I'm in partners with my uncle Bill, and we farm roughly 800 acres. Okay, Lindsay, it's your um, it's your desktop that's showing. <laughs> blame, it on, blame it on that inadequate broadband that we uh, have out um, in rural Maryland. That one was user error. So here we go. My name is John Bruning of Bruning Farms here in Snow Hill, Maryland. I'm in partners with my uncle Bill, and we farm roughly 800 acres uh, here in Worcester County, and it's a split rotation, um, half and half between corn and soybeans. So we do continuous no-till on our farm because of the sandier soils, and we try to conserve as much moisture as we can in that seed bed for the crop. Yeah, so what we're looking at here, we're a continuous no-till operation, and this is a soybean field that was harvested yesterday, and you can see the corn residue. Um, if we were really looking, you could probably find um, residue from three years, and there's definitely, you know, a little bit of barley on top that is still breaking down from the, uh, from the cover crop. Okay, so this is the spreader that we use for a cover crop. Um, right now, it's full of winter wheat. And we've got this set, this gate set to roughly 110 pounds per acre. We're playing it a little heavy right now because it is November 10th. Granted, it's warm and I think we'll get great germination, but I like playing it heavier as it gets later to make sure we get a um, really good germination and cover established. We just spun on 
uh, winter wheat as a cover crop, and we're using this turbotill to incorporate the seed without doing too much tillage because we are a no-till operation. So this is just disturbing maybe the top two inches of the seed bed to get a nice germination on that wheat. Yeah, so we've got 70 kW of solar here that we put in to sustain um, our drying of corn in the grain bin complex. Yeah, so we put these in in 2010. Um, we utilized a USDA grant um, as well as a Maryland state um, tax credit, which was certainly a big help. Yeah, so with this 70 kilowatt of solar, we bank our energy credits. December, and uh, it provides enough energy to make it a break even to, uh, for our electricity costs. I'm Jason Scott. I'm a farmer here at Walnut Hill Farms in Herlock, Maryland. I farm, it's a fully owned family farm, um, farm with my mother and father, and then we also have a cousin that helps us out and a few employees as well, especially during the busy season. Uh, we grow mostly corn, soybeans, wheat, and barley. We also grow some vegetables. We do grow sweet corn for processing currently, and uh, we also have a seed business for Pioneer. We sell in uh, three different counties for Pioneer and uh, sell corn, soybeans, and wheat for them. Um, our farm is about 1,500 acres, but we also do some custom harvesting and spraying for uh, another cousin that also farms in the area. I've been on the Grain Producers Board basically since I graduated from college back in 2003. And then in 2008, I became representative um, of Maryland on the U.S. Wheat Associates Board, which is the Wheat Export Board um, representing U.S. wheat producers uh, all over the world. Um, and then in 2016-2017, uh, I was chairman of U.S. Wheat. But I've remained on Grain Producers the whole time and, and now represent them or still represent them on the Wheat Board as well. Um, so now I'd like to invite you out to the farm. We're going to go see a little bit of corn harvest for this fall. So um, this is a yield monitor. So this is essentially giving me at all times um, a map of the yields as we go along the field. Um, actually in real time drawing that map. Um, this over here is, is dark green because that's what we finished yesterday. So it's not giving me the yields on that. But anything we're picking today... Dark green would be a higher yield, um, down to red would be lower, and we'll be getting into some like yellow and red here as we get out of the irrigated part of this field. Um, so it's giving me that, it's giving me the moisture content of the corn here. Um, so this is 20.9 or 20.98, almost 21. And then it also gives me the wet weight of what we've harvested. Um, I've got it set on load, so on this current load, Actually, this field is, is interesting because we did a strip trial here with a new product. We're planted 24 rows with the product, 24 rows without, all the way across the whole field. So at the end of the harvest of this field, I will take off the end rows and any dry land, and then I can get a, a good comparison of whether that product actually worked for us or not. So it's pretty interesting and, and valuable information to have. Not to mention the autosphere <laughs> and uh, the other combine control that, that you can have in the technology as well. Basically our corn here from, from the field uh, pretty much all goes directly into the chicken industry. Uh, here on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, we have a, a very large chicken industry and I guess Delaware as well. Um, and for on our farm, we do have storage. Um, we can store roughly a third of our corn crop uh, the other two-thirds would go directly into a feed mill. We have a feed mill right in, in the town here, Herlock, that we're nearby. And um, so that corn basically, uh, I think you saw some footage of me dumping on the grain cart. Uh, I will dump on the grain cart, which it, you know saves us a little bit. It's a little bit more economical because the combine doesn't have to stop. So we dump on the grain cart. And we've got all kinds of little hand signals and phone calls and everything back and forth to where I need them and when. And uh, then he goes and dumps on the truck. We run tractor trailers. Um, and then that corn is, is going, in this case, is going directly to a feed mill. Uh, so this particular variety here is a uh, 
Refuge in the Bag Acre Max with Leptra. So that's a lot of uh, jargon basically to say that instead of having to plant a separate variety for a refuge, the refuge corn, which is uh, something that the EPA requires, is mixed right in the bag with this. So that just takes one step off of our plate. Um, the things that this corn protects us from primarily are corn borers, which uh, we don't always have a problem with corn borers, but prior to BT corn, it seemed like we had at least one problem field every year. Um, and what corn borers can do is they, they will actually bore into the shank of the ear and they can make your ears drop before you get a chance to harvest them. They can also bore into the stalk of the corn and uh, cause standability issues. And you may see some standability issues in this field here, um, which are not not just at all related to corn borer. Um, we had a hurricane the first week of August this year with some 60 and 70 mile an hour winds. And this corn was a little bit damaged. We're still able to get most of it. The yield is, I would say the yield is hurting a little bit by that, but um, unfortunately uh, we definitely lost a few bushels off the top end and into really good spots from that hurricane. Uh, but back to the BT. Um, this corn is also protected from black cutworm, so that takes a pesticide out of our mix that we would typically spray in the spring. Um, we would spray a pesticide right when planting, the, or you know, right after planting corn before it comes up, that will take care of black cutworms um, so that we don't have to worry about them. They will actually cut the plant off at the ground early on in the, in the growing season. And then this one also has a product called Leptra in it that takes care of corn earworm. So here in Maryland, since we're in such an environmentally sensitive area, we have a pretty robust cover crop program through the state. Um, and a cover crop is something that we plant at, in the fall or just late summer, early fall, after a corn crop or after a soybean crop that helps to stop erosion as well as take up any nutrients that are left over from the commodity crop from the year before. We actually flew on a cover crop. Um, we had an airplane come out, spread. It's a, a mix of half uh, wheat and one quarter radish and one quarter Austrian winter peas. Oh yeah, absolutely. So looking back to roughly 25 years ago, um, we were putting a pesticide on almost every acre, uh, an insecticide on almost every acre early on in the season to protect against black cutworms. Um, outside of that, a lot of years we would have a corn borer issue uh, at some point that you might have to spray for. And then um, there would definitely be more corn earworm sprays in the fall. Not something that we have to do every year, but but definitely something that, um, that we have done. So we have a pretty robust and integrated pest management program here on the farm. Uh, we have a hired crop scout who is another set of eyes actually looking at every field every week. Um, and he actually has multiple employees. So it's, it's even beyond that. It, he doesn't send the same scout to the same field every week. So that way I'm looking at it. I have an employee that's checking fields occasionally and then our scout is looking at it. So that's three sets of eyes. I don't get there every week, but, but uh, the scout definitely does. And honestly, we don't use a pesticide unless we have to. So we farm in Herlock, Maryland on the Eastern Shore, and it's very sandy soil here. Um, though we do get a fair amount of rain, uh, we average about 40 inches of rain a year, um, our soils don't hold on to a lot of water. Um, so we have center pivot irrigations. Um, we have, I guess it's 13 or 14 pivots now, and uh, that covers about half of our acres on our, on our operation. Um, that allows us to mainly take out one of the biggest risks in agriculture, which is the weather. Uh, it doesn't completely eliminate it because you can't always have too much rain, or you can have, like I said, in this field, you can have a hurricane um, come through and, and hurt your crop a little bit but it takes out the, the issue of lack of water and drought. So in Maryland, ever since the late 90s, um, we've had nutrient management in the state. Uh, and uh, every farmer in the state has to have a plan. They're required to have a plan. Um, that plan has to be basically by field and then updated 
uh, at a minimum of every three years. Most people update them every year. I update mine every year. Um, so the main things that go into that are your field maps and um, how everything is, is laid out on your farm. Uh, soil tests, which we soil test every acre every year. And then about half of the farm, we actually do grid sampling every year. Um, so we'll do that on like a three-year rotation where we'll grid sample for three years and then go back to just one sample per field. The grid samples are on five acre blocks. So say we have a hundred acre field, we take 25 acre samples in that field and then we can lay that out on a map um, and uh, actually get a map of how the nutrients come in or how the nutrients are in that field. Um, so that's, that would just be where the samples are taken for that particular farm. And then that creates a map like that, that will give you your pH, your phosphorus, and your potassium on a grid for that whole farm. And then you can then spread your fertilizer based on that or spread your lime based on that for the pH. Um, and we do that, you know, we, it's pretty expensive to do. So we don't do it on every field every year, but we do like to do that just to kind of double check things and, and even up the fields. Um, anyway, back to nutrient management. Um, you take your soil tests, you take your yield goal for each field, and then that all goes into this computer system. And then basically you get a recommendation out of the computer system for exactly what fertilizer you need to apply. Um, it even goes down to this one tells you, you know, at green up, this one's for wheat. At green up, you should put down half of your nitrogen. And then again, um, a few weeks later when the wheat's a little bit larger and uh, split that nitrogen so you're not putting it on all at one time and, and putting it all at, at more risk of running off or volatizing into the environment. Um, so this is something we have to do every year. And then at the end of the year, we take um, on a whole farm basis for each crop, we report back to the state how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium we used on that whole crop. Um, and that gets reported in uh, by March 1st of the following year. We've definitely learned to live with it and uh, how to utilize it to maybe do a little bit better job managing fertilizer in and, and, and our operation. Hi, my name is Mary Lou Brown, and this is my daughter, Ashley Brown. We run Maple Breeze Farm. We own and operate six chicken houses and we grow approximately a hundred and um, thirty thousand birds at a time every time we put birds down so in reality the what we produce on this farm those people that sit in Raven Stadium for a football game on a Sunday afternoon we can feed each and every one of them for years we are standing in an acre piece of Muscansa plot. It is a sterile grass, so the fuzzies that are above us will not cause it to propagate. We planted rhizomes from the beginning um, uh, in a single row, and now that you can see that they have kind of expanded out, um, but and it's real thick. It is good for chicken litter. They have found they have run tests on it, and now there are companies on the eastern shore of Maryland and in North or South Carolina that use this for their chicken litter, and it works very well. What you see behind me are the solar panels that totally power this farm, six chicken houses. They were built in 2014. I was paying a utility bill of about 30000 a year to power our chicken houses. And now um, I pay ten to twelve thousand a year. That's how much it um, dropped in August of this coming year. I will pay these panels off, and so I was able to finance them. On this particular poultry farm, we do every best management practice that we can. Um, right behind me, you see the buffer strip that we planted completely around the chicken houses. It protects the farm from the road and also it provides a great windbreak. And then another best management practice is the um, cement pads that we have at all our doors on the chicken houses. 
and we have expanded them. All CAFOs are zero discharge permits. This CAFO is unique in the fact that we have a buffer built over here to the right of these three chicken houses that prevents water from running off from the farm at all. We have no runoff. Every flock, um, between flocks, the big deal is to handle the manure properly. And we'll crust out, and what you see behind me on your left is um, the crust out from our chicken houses from our last flock. And um, that is used in our composting operation. We use this um, crust out to compost our birds. And on the side of this building, we have a composter. What you see behind me, all of this goes to a local farmer who buys it from me. And he, um, he uses it on his crops according to the nutrient management plan. All this is tested. So um, he knows exactly what's in it. In fact, he likes to compost the best. Before we put anything down, uh, we have to make sure that our litter is ready to go for new chicks. So we do windrows and there's usually three to four piles in the middle of our chicken houses. What that does, that heats up the litter and it breaks down any bacteria um, from the last flock and it breaks it down so it kind of makes it almost brand new for the baby chicks that are going to come in. And that gets turned once and then is set again for a couple more days after it's been spread out and leveled. Then we have something called A7 or alum that gets put down, that ties up the ammonia in the litter. Uh, it is really important to have extra feed down for the baby chicks because they grow a lot in about a week and you want as much feed down as possible. And the paper here has feed on it also. And where you see these lines that are raised, the water lines, so when they come in, they're going to put the birds down right in this area. So they usually put them right down on the paper. As you can see, there are curtains. There's a curtain behind me, and then there's a curtain on that end. But what you see here is the brood chamber. This is where the baby chicks will stay seven to 10 days. The temperature is extremely important when baby chicks come in. Right now, the temperature is 93. So, um, and what you're hearing behind us is a heater running. We have seven sets of heaters in this particular house that are tied to the sensor and um, there are seven sensors and we are tied to this chicken house the entire time the birds are in here. I have on my phone, we get called the moment that the temperature varies seven or 10 degrees. We have, um, it's an app on our phones that we can actually, it, we have the controller sitting on our phone. So it's not that we don't come here to the farm if we get an alarm, but it's nice to see when either we can't get here right away just to see what's going on. Our service person will come in here in the next few hours and he will take CO2 tests and ammonia tests and they have to be at a certain level in order for bird comfort. So um, everything is tested out and we are giving guidelines to, for setup purposes. So this is brooding. This is what brooding is. Now we'd like to show you what it looks like when you have chickens brooding. Today we're standing in a chicken house that received chickens yesterday, less than 24, a little over 24 hours ago. Um, we have currently 26,000 birds in here. As you can see, the birds are eating and drinking. They are on the paper around the turbo pans that have the extra feed in them. And these birds are happy little birds. As some of the environmental things that we do in this house, the lights that I have are all LED lights. These are 15 watt LEDs. Later on, we will give them eight hours of darkness for sleep. And we find that they grow better that way. They need rest just like we do. And um, we also have um, these radiant tube heaters that really do a great job of heating. These birds go out at 56 days, 55, 56 days. They will be nine pounds when they go out. Okay. Each house is equipped with fail safe and backup fans. What happens is if the um, house reaches a certain high temperature, 
the backup fans, which are big 52, in this house, 54 inch tunnel fans, will kick on to keep the birds comfortable um, automatically. We have backups in another way. Um, if we lose um, water from our well in this house, we have a back feed from our other house's wells in order to keep water to the birds at all times. So every day we walk the house, um, we check to make sure everything's working, if the birds are comfortable, which is the primary um, thing is to make sure the birds are comfortable. Um, we make sure that uh, they have feed and water all the time, um, that they have access to it all the time. If I'm not comfortable when I walk in the house, my chickens are not comfortable. I need to be comfortable, then I know the birds are comfortable. I have to admit, 93 degrees right now is not comfortable, but they love it. So they go from 93 down to 60 degrees by the end of the flock. And it is on a temperature curve and it ramps down. COVID was a challenge for the poultry industry. We had to, in just on this farm alone, we had to change some management practices. What we found was the processing plant was the kinker to the whole industry. We had to slow our chickens down because when you're dealing with a live product, it's on a timetable and everything's scheduled out. What happened with us was we lucked out. COVID hit, really became strong about the second week into one, one of our flocks. We had to change some management practices we did with a flock to slow them down, which I don't really, the chickens adjusted and they didn't really slow down. And, um, but we really were fortunate. A plant, um, Got, got all its lines processing again, then they didn't have enough birds to run through it and was a plant that ran processed birds smaller than what I normally grow. And they took my birds at 49 days and processed them. And then because they need, were worried that they were gonna need the bigger birds in the fall, it turned around that we had a 21 day layout, which for is ideal in the chicken industry. In the end, we really did make out well. But COVID, we found out the processing plant was the kinker, but I am confident that the processing plants have made the employees feel comfortable and that they feel safer coming to work than going anywhere else. So I think we're in good shape right now with whatever happens. Hello, my name is Bill Mason Jr. And uh, we're in Roosburg, Maryland. Well, we're in an organic farming business. Um, I'm Kate Mason Krzyzewski. Um, I am the fifth generation on the family farm here, and I run our retail produce market. My name's Stephen Krzyzewski. I'm Bill's son-in-law, and this is my wife, Kate. And I help Bill full-time with the organic uh, grain operation here on the farm, and also uh, run the produce stand with my wife, Kate. We are located in Queen Anne's County, Maryland. We've been in the farming business for over 100 years. We started out as a traditional farm. Uh, my dad, as I can remember, we milked cows and had hogs and uh, all sorts of animals. Uh, we transitioned out of that. In the mid 70s, we installed irrigation systems on our farms. And we got into uh, vegetable business growing fr uh, vegetables for local canneries, including sweet corn, string beans, peas, lima beans. We also grew uh, field corn, soybeans, wheat, and barley. Did that for a number of years. And then in about 2005, we transitioned, started transitioning our farm to organic. We rented an organic farm and began transitioning. It took us about 10 years to transition all of our ground to organic and now we have about a thousand acres that we farm organically. Um, in 1988 uh, my parents opened up a roadside produce stand. Um, it was just a small area uh, at the time that they grew corn and tomatoes uh, to sell to local customers and over the years uh, it's expanded uh, little by little here. Um, after college I worked for the Maryland Department of Agriculture so I started uh, on that route in 2011. Um, I took it over from them um, and it's definitely grown over the years to where we now not only grow um, fruits and vegetables, we have other local goods, cheese, milk, yogurt, ice cream, 
Um, we actually also carry beef from my husband's family farm in New York, um, which is a nice addition. Uh, and it's, so it's definitely grown over these uh, this past almost decade. And I arrived on the scene about 10, 11 years ago in 2009. I met Catherine in school and made the move down here and then eventually made the transition to work full time for my father-in-law. And we've been working on uh, organic farming techniques using uh, cover crops and, and best management practices uh, in our fields uh, uh, since then. And it's been going along really well and also helping uh, my wife transition the, the business from her parents um, into her capable hands. We have been working with the local soil conservation office for numerous years. We have installed tiles in uh, several other fields and have improved some of our older tile lines in recent years. We do have some filter strips around many of our ditches. Some of those practices are cost share and some of them we have installed in our, on our own. Um, they help filter the water out before it gets to the stream to help hold the nutrients in the field and we like doing that. We also use uh, or have used uh, no-till production in the organic farming business, which is sort of a new uh, uh, thing on the scene for organic farming, where generally speaking, we till the soil, we plow and cultivate, and, uh, but we have grown uh, as many as 300 acres of no-till soybeans with uh, uh, pretty good luck, and it saves us some time and fuel, and uh, uh, we like doing that. We're currently working with uh, NRCS and EQIP programs, the share programs uh, for the state and at the federal level uh, to try to uh, improve our, our cover crop, our planting, our, our biomass. As, as you may or may not know, in organic operations, we rely heavily uh, on growing either our nitrogen for a corn crop or a, a strong, heavy biomass to suppress weeds for our no-till soybeans. And also uh, partnering with uh, groups like uh, Future Harvest and uh, for river keepers to uh, implement some of the practices uh, that my father-in-law mentioned and uh, different uh, uh, adding mixtures or adding species to mixtures to improve our, our stance. We have been dealing with uh, Farm Credit Bank for approximately 40 years. Uh, we started with the purchase of a farm in 1979 and have enjoyed working with Farm Credit. They are um, obviously farming oriented and they know our problems and most of the time they come up with solutions to help us uh, continue into farming whether it's land purchases or equipment purchases uh, for lines of credit um, we've enjoyed working with them our first experience with farm credit was maybe five or six years ago we put in a walk-in cooler and freezer unit um, at our market to store vegetables and the meats that we sell at the market um, and that was obviously a great first experience uh, relatively simple and um, easy to easy to do and then we recently just uh, purchased our first combine through farm credit their farm credit is very easy to work with and they make the process very simple for us um, despite us both being in the farming industry our entire lives, um, there's still a lot that we don't know when it comes to um, the finances and the loan aspects. And so they make it very simple. As an organic farm, we use poultry litter as our primary nutrient source, of uh, course, for corn ground. And we'll apply that every other year. We're in a two year corn and soybean rotation. And having the poultry litter is a very nice option uh, for the, our organic operation because it's a cheaper source and it of course provides a lot of other secondary and uh, micronutrients uh, to go along with it. We apply, of course, based on nutrient management regulations, I handle writing the plan and making sure that we're complying with uh, all the, the nitrogen and the phosphorus regs as they are rolling out, uh, currently ro rolling out, and always try to be aware of that we're trying to maintain a good phosphorus balance since that's a very, that's a key nutrient in the Chesapeake Bay uh, recovery and for the watershed and for a lot of the WIP goals throughout the state of Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay region. As far as the COVID-19, we, we, it has affected us some, but being in the farming business, we are uh, generally not dealing with a whole lot of people, which has been nice. Um, we're a little more secluded out here on the farm. On that note, uh, Farm Credit did help us with uh, securing a uh, PPP mm -hmm. loan. 
uh, and that helped us uh, for several months there with payroll and some um, other payments, and that worked out uh, very well. For us, luckily, our retail business uh, stayed relatively even um, compared to previous years, um, but there was definitely a shift in our customer base. We saw a lot more local traffic, um, local customers um, who preferred to stay out of grocery stores um, or shop in a smaller space or be outdoors um, doing their shopping. Um, and a lot less of our weekend traffic. Um, in previous years, we do get a lot of traffic from the D.C. and Virginia area, people traveling to the beaches, um, but we definitely did not have that this year. But it did all balance out um, for us fairly well in the end, so we were very lucky in that respect. Um, and like my dad, we did also receive a PPP loan for uh, from Farm Credit, um, and that was a big help to us. Yeah, COVID it did impact us on this, as far as uh, some or our uh, local uh, help that we hire every summer to help in the high tunnels and pick in the garden. Uh, we weren't able to hire as many as we uh, typically do. So we're a little bit short staffed, but the PPP loans definitely helped, you know, provide some, some relief there. And, uh, and hopefully we'll be back to maybe uh, some sort of normal this next year. Um, the food bank, which we participate in donating to, um, that became a, a, a more urgent uh, case this year. And we, um, throughout the summer and the fall, uh, donating uh, sweet corn and vet other vegetables. Uh, we're happy to participate uh, with them. And uh, probably one more note as far as the, the, uh, the farm aspect of uh, COVID and what's impacted, we typically like to host a lot of different uh, groups here, either from the University of Maryland, uh, certain classes, and just certain groups coming on the farm um, to learn about agriculture in this region. We uh, typically host two to three probably those events a year, and unfortunately weren't able to, um, uh, thanks to COVID. But um, hopefully in the future, we'll be, be back to uh, participating and, uh, and sharing our story and, and our love of farming. Well, uh, <clears throat> Lindsay, that was a great presentation. Not as good as actually being out outside and meeting people and seeing all that stuff. Um, Although I, I have to say, one of my favorite experiences uh, from prior years was climbing up into the tractor and uh, being like, th well, I'm sure it wasn't 30 feet off the ground, but it seemed that way. And it was, it was a lot of fun. So, you know, <clears throat> in any case, um, I, I saw some great questions. And would you just like to go straight into questions or do you have any other presentations, Lindsay? Well, how you, we'll play it whichever way you want to. Uh, sure, we can just go straight into questions. It looks like all of the farmers are with us, as well as um, Holly Porter with the Delmarva Chicken Association and Kurt Fuchs with Farm Credit. And Cassie is here with us from the Department of Agriculture, should you have any questions for them. Well, why don't, uh, why don't, I, why don't I start with this? Uh, one of uh, our members asked about no-till farming and could somebody just uh, describe what that is and how it's different from the old style of farming, perhaps? Uh, I think maybe um, Bill or Steven, if you guys wanted to talk about no-till and um, how that's kind of different that you guys are using that in an organic system. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Great, they, great, yes. Uh, so as far as uh, no-till is concerned, uh, actually with organic farming, it is or has relied primarily in, in most cases for most farms or at least most grain farms. Uh, and the Eastern Shore here is no exception on uh, more tillage um, than not. Um, uh, with our operation, although we have tried to move towards more no-till as in, primarily in soybeans, and uh, what that involves primary, uh, basically is, if you maybe remember from the last video uh, for this operation, is growing a lot of biomass and participating in the cover crop program. And uh, early cover crops established in the fall, uh, done, uh, done properly and early enough and um, at to the high enough rates, will, uh, like for example, cereal rye, since we, I mentioned no-till soybeans, will be able to grow enough biomass in excess of 6,000 pounds of dry matter an acre, which is a, is a fair, it's a fair amount of rye. It's very tall, four to five feet uh, minimum and very dense. And it will be rolled over 
laid flat on the ground with a tool called a roller crimper, which you can uh, install in front of your tractor or behind, but it just has to basically drive over. It's just a heavy weight that just flattens the crop down, which will smother weeds and we'll be able to use um, a planter, sometimes a drill de depending, but we have chosen to go strictly with a planter and plant right through that residue uh, straight into the ground and uh, allow us uh, some some relief from the weeds to to change uh, how competitive they are to reduce their competitiveness and um, give us a chance to maybe focus on some other crops like our corn crops to um, uh, to just do a better job of weed control um, in, in that respect. But uh, yes, uh, uh, tillage though is still primarily um, a mainstay for us in the for our corn. We grow, as I mentioned, our nitrogen with the cover crops too. We have two types of cover crops and in the spring, once that cover crop is matured, it's typically crimson clover. It's an annual legume. We will till it under roughly the end of April, the beginning of May, and turn it under. And it usually provides roughly about half of our nitrogen for our corn, uh, which is very useful. It's the cheapest uh, uh, source of nitrogen for our crop, and the rest we will supplement with poultry litter. Uh, but all that tillage uh, is required, and it does um, it does it can take its toll depending on certain years, certain times of year. If a storm comes up. It can be problematic, and we are looking for for ways to to address address um, tillage in the corn too. But soybeans is a is a good step, and we're working on uh, crop crop mixes and certain species to complement uh, the rye, maybe clover that will help us accomplish that. Thanks, Stephen. And maybe John, do you want to talk about in a conventional system the benefits of cover of uh, tillage or no till and why you do that? Yeah, sure. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. we we've gone to a strictly no till. Um, our farm lies right along the Shinktig Bay. It is very sandy soils. Um, as you can see from some of the pictures in Lindsay's video, and the main benefit of no-till that we are seeing is conserving your moisture in your top um, seed bed where your crop is growing. So in June, when that corn is trying to pollinate and your crops are trying to produce seed, um, you know, and we, you know, you get dry spell it really helps out having that mulch layer. It dries out less. And, um, you know, we've really seen, doing some trials, we've really seen a big difference here. Um, it helps with erosion. When, you know, when you're filling the soil and you're disking, um, you get a heavy rain event. Um, you can see erosion followed by compaction um, and no-till. I mean, it, it, it really fits, fits our, um, um, rotation. Okay. Um, uh, would anyone else like to add to that? Or I've got a couple of other questions here. Let's move on then. Uh, we've got questions from delegates uh, David Fraser Dalgo, Sheila Ruth, I think Andrea, but maybe I'm not, well, certainly DFH and Sheila. Should I go ahead first? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you for everybody putting this on. This is this is great. And um, while it's great to be in person, in some ways you can see so much more in such a condensed period of time. So for, uh, I guess it's the Krasuski family, the organic, that is doing everything organic. I guess my, my really big question is um, often we hear how challenging it is to be to be organic for a variety of reasons. And I'm curious, how have you, um, how have you tackled the, you know, kind of the pests and a lot of the um, traditionally uh, challenging farming practices without the use of, of the chemicals? And, and what has that done to your yields? And can you just speak a little bit more about what it's like to be an organic farmer? Well, we, we um... We started doing this 15 years ago um, for several reasons, um, but uh, I'd say most importantly, we 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 felt as though uh, in the early 2000s the uh, the prices of 
fertilizer and chemicals and seed were continuing to rise, but yet our income seemed to be continually shrinking. And we just decided that we needed to uh, find a different route to go for air farm. Um, it is a challenging uh, business to be in. Weeds are probably our number one issue. Obviously we can't use any um, commercial chemicals or fertilizer, uh, but through the use of poultry litter and cover crops, we are providing um, most all of our nutrients for our crops. Um, we've learned a lot and we're still learning a lot, uh, but as we have said on here, we, uh, we do till all of our ground or most of our ground. That's a common practice in no-till. And my father used to say it was the way he farmed 50 or 75 years ago where we used uh, the plow and the cultivator and manure to grow crops. And we're similar to that today. Um, but we have tried the no-till quite a few years out of the 15 years, probably uh, two thirds of the years we have grown no-till soybeans. We've also uh, touched in no-till corn several times. Uh, but again, weeds are the major issue. We do have several pieces of specialized equipment uh, for dealing with the weeds, um, but it is, it's still a challenge. Yields. Yields. As far as our yields are concerned, um, I generally tell people we are growing about two thirds of the uh, conventional yields. Um, but yet the prices we receive are normally about double the price of conventional grain. And so it usually works out um, pretty good for us. It's a lot more work um, then, uh, I'd say most of the farmers in Maryland, I think Maryland is one of the leading states in no-till farming and, uh, it's a good practice. Um, but, um, their yields have risen, uh, a fair amount in the last years. You know, they got uh, good quality seed. The no-till has helped and, um, they use a lot of good practices. Whereas in organic farming, we are limited um, to any commercial pesticides or fertilizers, as I just stated. So consequently, our yields are, are lower, um, but it is made up in terms of the price that we receive. We receive, we receive. Uh, the demand for organics is very strong and has been actually ever since we've been in there uh, business for 15 years. Steve, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, that. I just wanted to follow up what you touched on about the the pests and right having fewer options than um, uh, than the most uh, conventional uh, growers of small grains and um, corn and soybeans. Uh, we typically just we tolerate pests uh, to the greatest extent possible. We've had times where we've needed to apply some uh, select um, organic products, usually uh, an insecticide, uh, typically. And, but uh, we will usually keep an eye on our crops and um, we'll scout them if need be. If we think something's wrong, we can call an ag service uh, a dealer and get somebody out here to check and see if it's reached an economic threshold where, where yeah, if you let it go any farther, you will suffer a significant yield loss or you know, they'll tell you whether it's prudent or not to apply at that point. And we've had to do that, but it's actually fairly rare. And we've had fairly good luck uh, with pests. Um, and the diseases, right, we, we instead of, you know, have a philosophy, I guess, as our organic farmers or just the whole organic industry uh, considers as uh, more uh, just tolerance um, and management of pests rather than eradication or elimination due to the fact that the, we have limited options and they are quite expensive. So, so I guess what I'm hearing you say is one of the big differences is that you try to manage the pests as opposed to eliminate them. Yes, that's, yeah, that's correct. correct. That's conventional. Correct. And then this, the last question I have is, um, is there, an, I mean, I guess you kind of mentioned there, is there a, a big, robust, increasing demand for organics? Or is it just kind of a steady, you know, sales incline? Or is it spiking at all? Or what? what's the pandemic done as far as 
organic is concerned or in general? I think in general, ever since we've been in it, they claim that it's growing like 10 or 15% a year, which is a pretty good growth rate for any business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I personally think the younger generation's more concerned about chemical usage and pesticides. And um, I think they read a lot labels a lot closer than uh, us older people do. And um, I think that's also helped to drive the market uh, to keep it strong. Yeah, 10 or 15% is a lot, that's significant. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question goes to Delegate Ruth and then um, Delegate Gilchrist, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you everyone who took the time to come out and, and that was a, a fascinating video. Um, I was really, really interested to see how data-driven agriculture is. I, I had no idea I come from an IT background, so that was really interesting to me. Um, I was curious about the, the display with the color-coded yields um, and, and how that information is used. Is that something that like as you're harvesting, you would change like which parts do you harvest based on what colors show up? Or is that information that you're collecting for long-term, like would it affect how you, you know, what you do next year? Um, I can answer that if everyone can hear me okay. Um, I, you know, I think it, it's more of something that we would be uh, using this year's map as well as we, we've been doing this for almost 2000, since, since about 2000. So we've got 20 years worth of data that we can go back on and, and you can overlay those maps. And, you know, some years are different than other, a, a dry year, you might see uh, the sandier soils will have the lower yields where a wet year, the sandiest sandier soils might do better because they don't have excess moisture in the spring. So we can take a composite map of three to five average years and then uh, make some management decisions based on that. Um, I would say the, the decisions that we've changed uh, the most dramatically over the past few years is we, we use variable rate seeding. So um, specifically with corn, in the best areas of the field, we will plant more, plant, more plants, um, like roughly 35,000 to 38,000 plants on irrigated ground versus in the dry land corners where we're, we don't have any irrigation, we'll plant 24,000 just because we're trying to maximize those good areas. And um, it's more of like a, an economic consideration on the dry land and, and minimize the cost on those areas that don't have the high, high yield potential. And then, uh, so that's more of a cost savings. We also use it um, on an environmental basis. Um, so in the same, same way, we vary, vary the rate of nitrogen that we apply to the field. So um, in the best areas of the field, we will apply a little bit more nitrogen because we have more potential there for, uh, for growing a high yielding crop. Thank you so much. Okay, I think uh, Jim Gilchrist, then the vice chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm, I'm wondering if the, uh, if the farmers and the, the ag community on this uh, line uh, have taken advantage of some of the ag agricultural preservation programs, and also if there's if there are local county programs in place where where you are. Yeah. Uh, I can say, as uh, far as uh, Mason's Farms is concerned, we have just recently taken advantage of the state ag preservation program. We work with our county very closely. They also kick in a little bit of money. And but uh, we saw it as a, uh, a good program fit for this farm uh, to preserve it uh, for entire, for ever, I guess, uh, to keep it in the farm. We wanted to keep the, keep it in the farming business. So it's worked well for us on one farm. Did you have an option um, to go just through a local program? Uh, I am going to tell you the honest truth. I don't know that. I know some people have taken advantage of um, other organizations that have bought easements, but we did not uh, go down that road. We, we decided that we were going to deal with the Maryland Ag Preservation Program. We like that. And so that's what we did. 
Thank, thank you. I would say for, for us, our operation um, in general, we have, I think, three or four parcels that are in ag land preservation. Uh, we do not have a local program here in Dorchester County, um, but we've used Maryland Ag Land Preservation Foundation's program in most cases, but we do have one farm that's in a watershed where we used one of the federal programs. And uh, that was a little bit uh, before my time in terms of the management of it. So I don't know exactly what that program is, but, um, but we, have, we do have one farm that's federally protected as well. Thank, thank you. Anyone else before I go on to the vice chair? Just um, to put that in perspective a little bit, just through the state program, um, as of uh, 20 and year in 2019, there was 318,000 acres in the Maryland Ag Land Preservation Program for under easement. Um, so with about 1.2 million acres of ag land in Maryland, um, about a quarter of our acres are enrolled just in the state program for permanent preservation. And then there are a couple of counties that have um, county level programs, including Montgomery um, and Frederick has a good program. And then there's also private and federal programs that farmers can participate in as well. And those programs are extremely important for the future viability of agriculture as you know, development pressure and the um, the, the cost delta between selling a farm for development and continuing to farm it. Um, so funding for those programs is very important. Okay, I'll go to the vice chair, uh, Stein. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I guess this is a question for, for anyone. Um, to the extent that COVID caused disruptions in markets or changes in prices for for your crops or your, your products. Um, do you think that once COVID recedes and hopefully that will be in, uh, in 2021, uh, do you think markets will go back to the, the, the way they were beforehand? Um, so that these disruptions will just be, that you might've experienced uh, will just be temporary. I can, I can take a stab at that one. Um, so early on in the year, our, our uh, general commodity markets were down pretty bad, um, not just related to COVID. Part of it was some of the China trade rhetoric um, that the federal government has been going through. Um, and then, you know, as COVID was uh, growing, I guess, uh, in general, we saw the, the, um, the equity markets as well as the commodities all continue a downward slide. But over the past, um, I guess it started probably in about early August, China started ramping up purchases of uh, soybeans and corn, both because of a pretty bad South American drought during the planting season. So our commodity markets have actually come up to uh, above pre-COVID levels over uh, basically over the harvest, which we, we rarely see the markets increase throughout the harvest like that. Um, there was also a couple weather events. One, a big derecho out in Iowa that wiped up a wiped out a, a pretty good portion of the corn crop in that state, which is that's our number one corn growing state. So that also caused something. Um, on top of that, the commercial um, commercial money is purchasing commodities as well. Um, you know, for for investment, trying to trying to make money on it. So we have had a run up in prices. Um, so uh, that's totally unexpected. Um, I haven't talked to any farmers yet that didn't have a fair amount contracted early and pre-sold. So you get to take advantage of a little bit of that. But, um, you know, looking into next year, things certainly look a lot brighter than they did if you had asked me the same question in the, the spring or early summer. Um, and then I think as the vaccine rolls out and we see things start to normalize just generally and, and the environment, I, uh, I think things will kind of even out a little bit. Um, vegetable farmers or uh, some of the dairy and beef farmers or, or uh, hog farmers may have a little, and chicken farmers, I, I guess, as well, were definitely affected a little bit differently than, than strictly grain farmers. So I'll let some of them chime in on that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Janelle, and I work with Lindsay. 
Um, I also have a direct-to-consumer beef business here on the Eastern Shore, and pretty much the demand for local products skyrocketed, which we're thankful for um, on our end. Our problem was the processing plants. They just couldn't process as much product as people were buying because the grocery stores were going empty. Um, but in the end, more people have decided to buy local, which we love and support as we have expanded our family's business for another generation. So that's how we have been affected here in a direct-to-consumer business. Hi, this is Hi, this is Mary Lou Brown and um, the poultry farmer and the processing lines. They have certain lines set up and products that they roll off and a lot of the food went into schools and such. And when all that changed, that really threw them and they had to re reorganize themselves. So when we all get the kids back in schools, I think everything will be better off. And if I may, I'll tag on to Mary Lou with that um, Holly Porter with the Delmarva Chicken Association, formerly Delmarva Poultry Industry Inc. If you still are saying DPI, like I still am as well. Uh, yeah, a lot of our, um, the, there's some survey work that came out and uh, chicken meat is still, um, is still in high demand, even through COVID, it was still in very much in high demand. So I think that, you know, long-term, I think that the chicken industry continues to see um, and we'll see us getting back to uh, those pre-COVID um, timeframes. Uh, it was just a matter of, you know, as Mary Lou said, when a lot of your, uh, when 50% of um, folks' meals were usually eaten out, whether that was at schools or institutions or restaurants, and that had uh, impacts, um, that definitely affected things. But as we move forward, as those businesses start to reopen, um, you know, I do think that this will uh, be temporary. Now, how long the temporary is sort of the question, you know, is this three month temporary, 12 month temporary, et cetera. But um, we do have some uh, bright outlooks, I think, for the future. Uh, anyone else? Uh, all right. I, I've actually got um, it isn't so much a question, but it's directed toward you, Jason. Uh, you know, I've found in my time as chair of this committee that uh, all sorts of different practices are important, organic, non-organic, GMO, it all has an important place in the um, uh, farm ecology and farm economy. And you mentioned GMOs, which allow you to use fewer pesticides and could you just expand upon that? Because I think it's important for people to understand the important place that uh, GMO foods do have in the mix of everything that we do. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, so, so in general, what I was talking about there was uh, BT corn products, which uh, have a built-in resistance to some certain uh, insect pests. Um, so that allows us, you know, in, in the past, and this would have been, this would have predated me on the farm, but in the past, it would, it would be often that our crop scouts would be out on the field and notice a corn borer problem or, or some type of problem out there where we would have to go out and spray to take care of that, uh, that pest. And, and today that is, uh, bred into what the percentage is, but it's a very high percentage of corn that's on the market. Um, and then, uh. You know, the EPA, of course, has regulations surrounding that, what I talked about with the refuge in the bag and the picture you saw with the, uh, the different colored corn. They put a, a different color treatment on that. So you can see that there is that 5% in there that is not resistant to the pest. And that's, that's just so that the pest doesn't build up resistance to the, uh, the BT product. Um, so I think it's a, I mean, it's a useful tool. It, um, it's become to the point now where it, it's a, you know, it's a management practice that, that most uh, non-organic farmers are using. Um, and I, I, I don't see it uh, going the other way. Um, I, know, I know there has been a big push to kind of get away from that. But with the technology that works today, and they can literally uh, hand pick a, uh, a gene and switch things around in, in the DNA of the plant. And it's, they use CRISPR technology of that. And I'm, I'm not even going to try and expand on that because I'm not an expert, but it's just literally the same technology they use to create the COVID-19 vaccine. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's the same thing that they're currently using in crops. 
and uh, they can just pinpoint exactly what they want to do in that plant versus, you know, years and years of breeding and hoping they get the right mix um, instead of just literally just taking it with some little miniature tweezers and, and putting it where they want it. So. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I you know, we are committee, we respect uh, all the members of the rural community and the farm community in our state. And we, you know, I speaking for myself, at least, I, I want to make sure that the farmers in our state have all the tools and opportunities that they have uh, to be able to be successful and to feed the populace and to do it in a way that helps to you know, minimize, you know, works well and helps to minimize impacts upon the environment uh, everywhere. So I, you know, I, uh, I think it's useful for everybody to hear what you have to say, but, you know, everybody, every farmer has their own way of achieving their goals. And so I'm very respectful of that. And my committee is as well, uh, broadly speaking. Um, sure. I, uh, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. I, uh, I'd be lying if I I'd be lying if I said that I haven't uh, looked into organic farming and and certainly done some research on it. I mean, I, I, there's there's definitely some benefit to it, and uh, it's a it's it's the the big growing portion of ag today. I mean, there are there are a lot of consumers that really want organic products. So uh, I've definitely looked into it, and um, I'm not saying I'll never do it. It's it's not something we're going to be doing right now, just because of labor and, and keeping up with the, the acres that we till along with the seed business that we have. Um, that's, that's plenty for us to do right now, but it is something that's, uh, that's always been in the back of my mind as, as a, a way to increase our profitability. Sure. It's all good. Um, let me ask another question and that this is another technology related question. Uh, I'd love to hear from all of you about your, um, uh, feelings about your connectivity over the internet. I know that a lot of people in rural Maryland and America uh, are concerned about that. Um, so if, if anyone wants to, if anyone wants to talk about that, I, I think my committee would be very interested to hear uh, what your needs are and whether we've done a good or bad job of uh, attaining them for you. Hi, this is Mary Lou Brown. On, on our farm, um, we have six computers, six controllers, and I'm tied in with it with the phone, but I have to have internet to make that connection. And it's iffy at times, definitely iffy. And if for some reason we're not, I don't get 5G out here. I get 3G, 4G, so it's it's tough at times to get the right stream that I need to carry the information I need to come across. So internet, really, it's important here on the shore that we expand that in the area. Okay, anyone else care to comment on that? Okay, well, that's, that's fine. Um, I, I can comment real quick. I, I was actually talking about it with a friend this morning. Um, here at the farm, we do have, uh, it's over the air Wi-Fi, so it's Del Marble Wi-Fi is the company. And the speed is not fast, but it's reliable. So, um, you know, we do have a reliable source here, but it's, it's very slow. Um, at my house, I have satellite internet and it's fast, but very, very unreliable. And this is, I mean, this has been magnified by what we're doing with school right now. I've got two young kids and um, this week, twice, we've had issues with the internet getting kicked off uh, while the kids were in their Zoom meeting or, or things like that. So we definitely have a ways to go to, uh, to make us uh, competitive with uh, what we see in the cities and towns around. And Kumar, what we've found, um, so, you know, I'm here in Queen Anne's County, which is very suburban now, right? Um, and what we've found is that Maryland is not very competitive in the federal grant programs like through USDA um, for rural broadband because we have quote unquote too much coverage. Um, but we still only have, you know, 50, 60% coverage statewide <laughs> in the rural areas. And that's if you're willing to pay, you know, 10 to $30,000 to have it run from the main line up your farm lane, right? 
Um, so, you know, I know Rural Maryland Council has been working in the broadband task force on some state level solutions. So I do think it'll be an important priority for the state moving forward, understanding that Maryland doesn't compete as well as, you know, states out in the Midwest for rural programs. You're saying that because Montgomery, Prince George's, Baltimore City and County and Howard County have such great coverage, uh, you guys are considered to be not worthy of federal grant money. Is that what you're saying? So some of the federal grants, specifically those through USDA that are focused on rural areas, um, even the counties out on the eastern shore and out in western Maryland, but, you know, um, because a significant portion of our counties in the more urbanized and suburban areas have coverage, it skews the um, percentage of coverage for that county and makes us non-competitive in those programs. Got it. Okay. Uh, that still seems unfair to me. Um, uh, Delegate David Frazier at Algo has a question. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the second bite. Um, I was, uh, you know, monitoring the chat and writing a lot in the chat. And one of the things that I've been working on here in MoCo, because we have the uh, Ag Reserve, is really trying to come up with ideas and um, policies to really promote more and more local um, farming. Um, from a sustainability perspective, it's so much better from the environment to not have to truck all of our produce from all over the country or all over the world. Um, we see because of COVID how apparent it is that we really need to diversify that, how dangerous it is to depend on um, you know, produce and crops and from, from other parts of the world. So, uh, and, and also the idea of buying local, spending local, keeping that dollar in the community, and how important it is to kind of keep we spending that dollar. Are there policies or ideas that any of you uh, have, or you know, when you're out there on the tractor and your mind's going that you go, you know, it would be really great if we could do X or we could do Y to really help get out the word. And it seems like COVID has really helped with that, but how do we, how do we capitalize on that? Because in many ways, I think we've dodged a big, bullet thus far, it could have been far, far worse. So I'm interested to hear any ideas on what we can do to really kind of promote and keep that dollar local as well as uh, from, from a food sustainability perspective and environmental footprint perspective. Uh, yeah, David, this is Steve Krzyzewski uh, speaking of, uh, in terms of uh, Mason Farms Produce uh, that uh, Kate and I run, but uh, we um, were able to take advantage of a program um, for on a, the federal grant level or for federal cost share level for a high tunnel, which is, it's a, like a greenhouse, but it's with plastic and it's um, it, open-ended, uh, open uh, unheated. And we were able to about seven or eight years ago, put our first one in, we now have three, um, but uh, only one of them has been cost shared. The program stipulates per farm or tract, you're allowed uh, one of these uh, buildings or up to a certain amount of money is allocated uh, per farm or tract. And we, we maxed out uh, with our first one to put up the largest one we could. And that certainly helped us out tremendously in um, reducing our labor and boosting our productivity. And as you were mentioning um, about the local movement and how important that is, we, we, we agree with you that it's certainly uh, much safer to have food grown uh, locally and without you know, going through so many different vectors and transportation and, and right. processes if it's coming out of state and all, the, and all the other safety issues that can come along with that. And um, we think we don't do, uh, we do some of our growing organically in the high tunnels, which it permits that we can, we water when we want, you know, we don't get monster <laughs> rainstorms uh, on the plants, which means we, we don't have to spray nearly, uh, nearly as often. And when we do, it's the organic products, although they're not quite as um, effective as a conventional product, we don't need the, the effectiveness because we do have, it's a controlled environment, controlled climate inside there and it's, it works to our benefit. But uh, while though we do grow some conventional uh, vegetables and organic vegetables, we think the most important thing is it's grown locally. That's the, that's the safest way to do it. You can still get organic vegetables from California, but it had to get here. It took, I don't know how many days by truck and how many hands it has had to touch to get here. We think local is probably the most, the most important uh, thing uh, you can do for local um, for people eating uh, healthy and well. Yeah, and how, my, and how much how many, how much fossil fuels are burned, burned to, to actually get from California to here? But if you have any policy ideas, anything that we can do, well, that's my big, 
uh, yeah. for any, any of the any of the ag folks, Lindsay, anything that we can, as a committee, uh, you know, as a policy perspective, what can we do to really highlight what's going on here? Um, I, I know. The only thing that I see as a huge challenge um, is local processing plants. I know we specifically use Solidal Meat Locker, but there's also people from Lower Shore or um, I'm sorry, Southern Maryland. So on the Western shore that come to Southern shore, it's like a two hour drive just to get their meat processed locally. Um, so I know that not necessarily on the Eastern shore, but possibly in other areas of the state, just getting local processing plants so that they can grow it, process it local and then sell it local is one need that we definitely have in the state. And also to tag on to that, um, a, a kind of log jam in that is the um, USDA FDA inspections. So in order to um, process the meat, the, the, the processing facility has to be inspected and Maryland um, no longer has a state level inspection program and the federal resources have significantly declined as well. So um, not only incentives for the actual, per, um, you know, the plants themselves, but we also need the inspection. Yeah, I have a local deer uh, sales bill and, and that's one of the things that I'm trying to surmount right now. It's very challenging. I, I think it's important to remember, I'm Mary Lou Brown. I think it's important to remember that the poultry industry is here on the Eastern shore because we are supplying New York and Baltimore and you know the East Coast cities, Philadelphia, with chicken, and that's why we are where we are. It's not we supply here too, but it's still locally that we keep it here on the shore, and then we are able to ship into that area where they're not going to be able to produce it themselves. Yeah, that should be scary for them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. Sure. I I'd also like to make a general comment. Um, I think this COVID-19 has uh, uh, proven how important local food is and how food is, uh, food is um, important to everybody, especially if you don't have it. But I also would like to say that I think one of your jobs would be to support the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, they have numerous programs by local Maryland's best that help promote the local um, uh, produce business or, or, or all the markets. They also, uh, I've been a part of for 25 years, the Soil Conservation Service, and, and now Steve is on the board here in Queen Anne's County, and um, they need all the support they can get from the state uh, as far as best management practices, uh, conservation measures, uh, all the regulations that we have put on us by the state uh, for helping clean the bay up, a lot of these measures are very costly and they do a pretty good job. But I can tell you from our own local office, a lot of times we're short on help. And I know the budget has been tight in the state, but we need to keep the Department of Agriculture fully staffed and especially the soil conservation to bring these practices about to help protect the, the water quality of the bay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for everything you're doing. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, welcome, Mary. Uh, uh, well, you, you just checked in for what I think might be the very uh, end of the event. Oh, hold on. We've got something here. Uh, Okay, great. Um, does anybody else um, anywhere have a comment or a question they'd like to add before we conclude this uh, presentation? Uh, yeah, Elgin Harrison. Good morning, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. I, I, I really did enjoy the presentation. It's great to see um, something a little different. You know, it has, not I would say, I think uh, Jen said um, that she was new to this. And so I think many of us are, especially as freshman delegates. And so I just wanted to say how much I really appreciate um, you all showing us the, the back hall basically of what happens and how we, um, how we get what we get um, because you do what you do. So I just wanted to say thank you. 
Yeah, that's um, uh, that, that's a really good uh, way to express, I think, all of our opinions here. I certainly was uh, going to say something to that effect as well. We appreciate it, and um, it's really great to be able to have this kind of conversation uh, with um, uh, with everybody. So um, it's actually what's kind of nice is having uh, usually when <clears throat> we go out uh, in rural Maryland, we'll see one farm family and another and another and another. We never have an opportunity to have all of you comment at the same time. So that's been really good and <clears throat> and helpful. So um, do we have it? Oh, let's check the chat here. Uh, any other questions? I don't think I see any. Um, Lindsay, everyone, thank you very much for this great presentation. Uh, I do look forward to getting back outside uh, after we've all been inoculated, though. So, um, uh, so in any case, uh, have a great holiday season. Stay safe. Stay, uh, stay well. And look forward to working with you and seeing you virtually, unfortunately, uh, soon. So take care, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye, Bye. Holidays. Bye guys. Happy holidays. Thank you.